This is the Awkward GM Corbin, and today I will be discussing the pros of being a mage in Mage the Awakening. Previously, we discussed the downsides of being a mage over here, and that was just a bunch of niche rules that sometimes weaken mages. This is a bunch of niche rules that strengthen mages and give mages a lot more buffs that you might not know about. First, I'd like to apologize. Um, the Mage the Awakening Strengths video is going to be split up across multiple episodes as I can't cover it all in just one episode. There's just so much about that, so I'm going to break it up into categories and release them over the course of a few weeks. I'm really sorry, but that's just the nature of editing sometimes. Shout out to our patrons for supporting the channel. First up, we have Obsessions. They are essentially bonus aspirations, and you get a number of them based on your Gnosis. They add bonus die to scrutiny rolls that fall under your Obsession, and you also gain one mana when you resolve them. Certain actions that mages do will grant arcane beats, which can be turned into arcane experience and act as a resource to purchase certain types of abilities, such as your Gnosis, your Arcana, your Praxises, and Legacy Attainments. Onwards to Gnosis. The more Gnosis you get, the shorter ritual casting time you have. The Gnosis stat is added to all spell casting rolls. The more Gnosis allows for more Yantras in spell casting. Gnosis 6 plus will allow you to increase your trait limit above 5. Gnosis stat is how many determines how many spells the mage can have active at one time. Gnosis determines the number of obsessions you can have. The more Gnosis unlocks ranks in legacy attainments. The more Gnosis increases the number of spells you can combine. The more Gnosis increases the maximum arcana rating limit you have. Gnosis is added to your supernatural tolerance rolls. More Gnosis increases the amount of mana the user can store and use per turn. Gnosis determines your Nimbus, and each Gnosis dot grants one free Praxis. Onward to mana. Mana is a resource such as Vitae or Vampires that you can use in your spell casting. It is spent reflexively to improve a spell outside your character's ruling arcana. Reduce Paradox dice pool by one die per point of mana spent activating certain attainments, activating certain powerful spells, and legacy attainments based on spells that would cost more than one mana only need one mana. In order to gain mana, you can do it through oblation or meditation at a hollow. It's gnosis plus composure and you gain one mana per success on the roll. You could use prime three to channel mana at a hollow without oblation. You could eat Tass, which is essentially crystallized mana. You could fill, fulfill an Obsession, which would give you mana. You could scour your pattern by reducing a physical attribute or taking damage. It's limited per day based on your Gnosis. You could also do a blood sacrifice of a living being, but that is an act of hubris breaking point at certain wisdom levels. <laughs> Speaking of wisdom, we have the wisdom section, which we talk about acts of hubris. You get a plus one to resist an act of hubris if it's in line with your virtue. You can ignore or inuring, inuring yourself to an act of hubris on a spell in the future if you lost wisdom while casting it. But but it will always cause paradox at a two dice pool base. You can also risk wisdom loss to grant yourself arcane beats. So far I'm seeing a lot of avenues to get um, arcane beats so I don't know if you'd want to do that really. There is something called Pattern Restoration, which if you spend three mana you can heal one bashing or one lethal or remove a mental condition or physical tilt. Not all mental conditions and physical tilts are equal in this regard. For instance, if you cause a physical tilt like arm rack with a magical ability, it's still a physical tilt so it can be removed. However, if you do shadow paranoia on someone, which is sort of a mental condition, it's not really a mental, a mundane mental condition. It is a supernatural one. However, if you were to give someone guilty, which is a m mental condition, that's a mundane ability, a mundane 
mundane condition, but it could be given to someone through supernatural means. And this is where we get into a lot of it's up to the story. I'm, it's up to the storyteller to make the decision as to whether or not it applies. Moving on to Nimbuses. Your immediate Nimbus grants a Nimbus tilt unique to your character. It automatically occurs when you're casting spells, and you can spend one mana to flare your Nimbus without casting. You can spend one mana to impart your signature Nimbus onto a person or object to mark your territory. You can use your Nimbus to counter a supernatural creature's aura, such as your uh, vampire's predatory aura, and impart your Nimbus tilt on them. Now we're going to be covering Mage Sight. So for Peripheral Mage Sight, it can detect any active magical effect that is not warded. However, there are some abilities in Signs and Sorceries that kind of adjust this. I'm not going to go into that because sadly I don't have Signs and Sorceries, I just have the core rulebook right now. Um, for Active Mage Sight, it includes your two path ruling arcana reflexively, but it also costs one mana for each additional common or inferior arcana you add as an instant action. It highlights any supernatural effect, even those that are not supernal, under whatever your mage sight arcana is. So if a ghost is using one of their powers, that's going to be under the death sight arcana, or death arcana. It also reveals all awakened spells as they are casted, regardless of arcana, as well as the nimbus of the caster. It lasts up to a minute per gnosis for one scene, however you can spend willpower to keep it active for an entire scene. It can also be used to detect, to detect concealed magical effects with a clash of wills if you focus. There are a various different type advantages that you get for each arcana. For instance, for death arcana, you can see the anchor conditions that are associated with ghosts. Ghosts are anchored to objects, so you'd be able to see that connection. For fate, you are able to see the existence of the destiny merit. For forces, you can see the environmental tilts. Um, for life, you can see personal tilts on NPCs and other characters. Uh, for matter, you can see the structure, durability, availability, and equipment bonus of all objects. For mind, you can detect if someone is asleep, comatose, awake, meditating, in astral projection form, and you can see if willpower is currently being spent. Uh, there are some people who say that mind arcana allows you to see any type of being that is that has a mind, even those in Twilight, though that can be controversial depending on your game master. Uh, for Prime, it highlights awakened magic, anything that can be used as a yantra, and mana-infused objects and locations. Space uh, shows bonuses and penalties due to range, spatial warps, scrying windows, and irises. For Spirit, you can see the gauntlet strength and the resonant conditions that are being used by spirits. And time, you can see the initiative ratings of all the participants in combat initiative. Also, it allows you to preempt reflexive actions, detect temporal warps, and to time travel, which can be very potent. For your focus mage site, uh, you have something which you can do, which is revealing surface level information about a supernatural mi mystery. This is called your revelation. It is a role. It has some mechanics associated with it, but they're not important right now. However, for scrutiny, you receive the rope quality on Clash of Wills related to seeing through magical concealment. Uh, for successes on a scrutiny equal to the opacity of the mystery, reduce the mystery's opacity by one. So for instance, if you roll your scrutiny roll on a mystery that is mystery five and you get five successes, that mystery's opacity goes from five to four. Uh, you can spend mana to add additional successes to scrutiny rolls so as long as the roll is successful. Failures cause spent mana to just be lost. Onwards to summoning. You are required to get five successes per rank of the entity that is being summoned. You can add additional successes to extend the duration of that summoning within the fallen world, so the creature being summoned can be in it longer. You can add successes to protect from abyssal intrusion, so you're not accidentally summoning an abyssal entity. 
and you can also subtract three successes required to summon in a domain because that's how you say demense it's actually domain which i apologize i don't speak french uh, domain oriented to the realm in question. So for instance, if you're summoning a fey creature from Arcadia and you're doing it in a domain that is oriented to the Arcadia, the supernal Arcadia, uh, you don't need to get three successes. Uh, three successes. You subtract those three successes from the total you need. You subtract successes if the summoner uses items and conditions that correspond to the realm in question. The storyteller can adjudic adjudicate or have the player roll intelligence plus occult and with every two successes removing one success required from the target number of the summoning spell. So if I say I'm bringing cards of like tarot cards in order to summon someone from Arcadia, um, I would have to roll my intelligence plus occult. I have 10 dice. I roll, let's say, three successes. That will only reduce the number of successes for summoning the creature by one. Now, there are different types of summonable entities. For the Death Arcana, you have Spectres from Styges. Fate has the Moray Fae from Arcadia. Forces have the Seraphim Angels from Aether. Life has the Atavism Beasts from the Primal Wild. Matter has the... And I, it's, it looks like Ape Iron, but it's probably a Pyrion Shades from Styges. Mind has Wraith Demons from Pandemonium. Prime has Cherubim Angels from Aether. Space has Imp Demons from from Pandemonium, Spirit has Totem Beasts from Primal Wild, and Time has Anachronism Fae from Arcadia. Now we talk about Soul Stones. Soul Stones can be used by mages as Yantras, even if it's not their Soul Stone. It can be used to create domains. It can be a proxy for the creator's sympathy, as both are connected to each other in regards to sympathetic connection. The creator is aware of all magic cast around the soul stone via the peripheral mage site ability, as if it's, a con it's an extension of themselves. Mages can study a soul stone to determine the creator's legacy. Uh, it costs one willpower dot to make, not one willpower point. It is a full dot to make one. And destroying a soul stone removes the gnosis limit penalty imparted by that soul stone for instance if you have three soul stones your gnosis can only go up to gnosis seven it can't go any higher but if you destroy one you can now go up to gnosis eight if you made it this far thank you so much here's another video that is mage related and i hope you have a good one